In this group, we try to address uh, question number three. What alternative exists to address scaling out uh, primary water management practices? Uh, first of all, we try to uh, understand where do we want to scale up or scale up. And finally, we agree that scaling up, scaling up is within the uh, Nile Basin, within the Ethiopian environment. And, and then we try to also understand what criteria to consider to scale, in, to scale up. If the practice works if at the landscape level, how can we scale up or scale up to the basin? And we tried, we uh, discussed that both biophysical and socioeconomic parameters under which certain practice or process works in the landscape should be considered. And then try to identify those parameters at the basin scale. But um, don't, that should not be the only criteria. And that can also be limited by data availability at the basin um, uh, scale. Um, I think that's the only uh, thing we could uh, figure out from this. Thank you. The last question, what alternative options do we have to link biophysical and livelihood issues? And so, uh, what actually is needed to allow this link to be effective? And the link actually requires that we follow a uh, few steps. So, first of all, we need the biophysical data. So, we need data on rainfall, for example, uh, sediment, nutrient loss and availability. And uh, accordingly, those feedback, then we can produce uh, data on productivity at the level of crop, livestock and trees. And then, uh, according to those data, we can uh, come up with uh, an economic model that will give us data on uh, benefit and uh, costs. So the point is that the, we have uh, in front of us some challenges, like the fact that uh, um, the establishment of this link between uh, biophysical and livelihood requires that we uh, we have to define this link uh, before actually we have the data available. So um, what are the options that uh, uh, we have in front of us? For example, we come out with this alternative, which is like the use of secondary data. And uh, uh, also another alternative could be like uh, combine secondary data with survey. In this way, we can strengthen the validation of our model. Uh, the point is that our secondary data would be available at large scale, at the administrative unit, that would be probably not specially referencing, but this will allow uh, us somehow to uh, test and to uh, validate our model, and when the data actually at the local level will be available, then we will be ready to include them in the model. Okay, we also addressed the question of the alternative options for linking biophysical and libraries. And I think our first and most important observation is similar to what that other group said, which was that a lot of this is going to be done in the way that you choose the rainwater management strategies, because everything else in the modeling is going to flow from what scenarios you choose to model. And so we need to make sure that we have that we consider the likelihood options or interests and issues when those are chosen. So that should be a, a careful process that involves a lot of people. And they should not just be the ones in this room, possibly. Then the second thing that we talked about was that we could be linking models that have biophysical with models that have social data. And in fact, that was covered in some of the presentations. But we concluded that you need to be very cautious about that because the extent to which some of these models are flexible enough to really include those things and the ease which, with, with which they can actually be integrated is not very high, especially as you get to the higher scales. So while that's something that's important to keep in consideration, it's probably not going to be the solution to, to all the linkage issues. And then the final thing that we talked about was how we need to make sure that we are getting feedback from and validating the results from these models in the communities. So we would want to be both using the data from the communities to help choose the strategies and also using the results to help kind of to feed into the discussions that are going on locally. And some of those will be in the innovation platforms in the field sites but probably we'll need to think beyond that. Because if we're going from basin level modeling 
then down to a few conversations that are going on locally, we may be missing out on some important areas. So we might need to think about how we expand some of that community work, not with the same intensity that it goes on in the innovation platform areas, but we'll need to begin something that more about. Okay, uh, our group have discussed uh, on the what alternative exists to address the scaling out of awareness and sending practice at a basic level. And uh, from our discussion, uh, we came up with that uh, the entry point for scaling out should be uh, the productivity or production gain. So uh, the changes in RMX practices should be properly linked with productivity uh, gains. And the other point which uh, we raised that the similarity and suitability analysis would help us in scaling out, but we should also uh, come up with uh, good of, uh, the level of adoption actually. This level of adoption probably uh, could, uh, could be uh, uh, decided or uh, could be uh, come from the innovation process or community conversation. conversation. Uh, the other thing which we we'll discuss is the impact of this RMS has, uh, has a temporal vulnerability and the temporal vulnerability is more important than the aggregated impact. So the scaling out should also consider this temporal vulnerability of uh, different impacts. And the other, one, the other point uh, which the group uh, came up with was uh, we should start uh, by modeling existing practices. Uh, we said that there are a lot of existing practices, including indigenous practices of our, uh, rainwater management system. So uh, we should start uh, our, uh, our modeling from existing practices by, character, by characterizing uh, the existing, even if they are small in number, we should characterize them uh, spatially and we should start by modeling the existing practices that we can scale out properly to the basin level. And the final point is, yeah, uh, is that the scaling out should build upon existing experiences, experiences of other similar projects and experiences of the waterers and the government institutions because they have this watershed management and they are talking about the scaling out so we should also build on their experiences and their plan of scaling out uh, RMS practices. First question, which is where we've been discussed, and we also discussed basically what types of data we were talking about and now it into two groups, hydrometric data and socio-economic data. Um, and basically the issues are that things aren't always measured when, where it's needed. Um, there's sometimes delays in getting data to, to modelers and the, the, the quality of data basically varies from place to place. But, we, but the first thing to acknowledge is that there is actually a lot of data available. So particularly for socio-economic data, for instance, there's a lot of surveys that have been done the central statistical agencies got masses of data and so on surveys and things, and this can be used at least as a starting point for a lot of the modeling that we want to do. So some of the solutions we came up with were for hydrometric data, perhaps correlating data between locations and between sites, and then this is one way of extending uh, short data series into longer data series that you can do, um, and things like there isn't data available, not just throwing up our hands in despair, but thinking about sensitivity analysis and doing model runs initially with uh, guesstimated data and thinking about if you tweak that data, if you're not sure whether it's good data or whether it's high quality data, then tweaking it and seeing whether it makes a big difference if you change the data in the, in the model solutions. And this is one way of identifying actually which data are important in the models that you're doing. So again, that would narrow down. Uh, what data you actually need to really focus on and hang on it. Thank you. A question about the scenarios, and uh, we started off with a few remarks on the impacts. Um, we said there are diff uh, many different impacts, economic, environmental impacts, long versus short term, and they all have to be taken into account when we talk about prioritization. And then we had a bit of a longer discussion about the scenarios, um, we started off with thinking that scenarios are some kind of combinations of interventions and practices that are targeted to specific areas in the basin. But then if we started thinking more thoroughly or deeper what, what this means and how to build them, then we, we had a bit of a discussion like um, do we base them on just biophysical suitabilities or how do we maybe involve the community 
but it was probably important to also uh, involve the communities through uh, the IPs or in any other process. Um, and then we went on with talking about what are the, the components of these scenarios. Um, we definitely have to look at the institutional environment and the social aspects, but also at the actual practices and how they, they change. And um, then we came up with, well, there are many different aspects you can kind of consider. And then using those aspects in, in, in access to come up with different scenarios, but how to decide which, which aspects to consider is not an easy task. And we ended up with that we might want to look at a similarity analysis to get some inspiration on which aspects to consider in these scenarios. We're addressing the challenge one, the data gaps, and how to fill the data gaps. No, we don't have the solution. First of all, we categorize the types of data that um, we would need, being hydrological data, mostly stream flow and meteorology, crop data, in terms of crop distribution types and productivity, lots of different types of livelihood data at household level, for example, about size, income, sources, food security status, access to markets, access to water. Um, those data would need to be aggregated according to the scales at which we are working from study sites to sub-basins to the full basin level, talking in hydrological units here. Um, we are aware that lots of data exist, they are spread out, they are not easy to find and even if they are identified, um, people may not be willing to share them, so there is an issue of um, finding a mechanism within the project to make the institutions that hold the data share those data with NBDC. And then we looked at possibilities, um, places for data, where they might be. One suggestion was to look for phase one data, and it turned out that these are also not very well consolidated or um, harmonized. There may be some in the IDIS database, um, mostly all global data sets of which one would have to still clip the respective sub-basin or basin at which one would like to look. Um, national institutions hold data but may also not easily share them, like ministries of water and agriculture, NBI was mentioned, and other networks, research institutions and national agencies. But we didn't get into details, we didn't have time for that. It was suggested that there is a need for central data coordination within the project, and um, somebody mentioned that this would be taken care of by N2. And it seems there's no central facility like a GIS facility that would um, have the task of um, harmonizing, making spatially explicit all those different types of data that we mentioned. That's as far as we got.